Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. Today we have a manga review of chapter 927, Otoko the Komoro. And what we have this week is something that I fear is going to be pretty easily dismissed amongst the fan base in general, because an argument can be made that nothing really happened, nothing of any importance I should say, but I actually thought that it was a lot of fun. Primarily because what I'm really craving right now is that proper full on straw hat reunion. That moment where we can see the whole crew together for the first time since Dress Rosa. And while we didn't quite get that this week, we had a mini reunion of sorts, which the more I think about it, the more I realize was absolutely necessary. This assortment of straw hats was not chosen at random. These are three of the four who weren't present on Whole Cake Island and who wouldn't have seen Sanji since Dress Rosa. So this chapter is going a long way to close the book on all of that. And all we really need now is for Sanji and Zoro to interact and we're back to business as usual. And it was just nice seeing these four interact in general. One thing that really interested me though, is just how completely unconcerned they are with Luffy's situation. They just have complete faith that he'll be out and ready to operate when necessary, which makes sense given how much faith they have in him. I just didn't think they'd be quite so casual after having seen all of their reactions to the news of him being imprisoned. But hey, that's not our concern this week because just as seated in the last chapter, we have some trouble brewing around Sanji from the Kyoshiro family. Now the guys who attack Sanji are pretty much the epitome of stock standard grunts, but the few glimpses we got of Kyoshiro himself are actually starting to make me appreciate him a lot more. I wasn't sold on his design initially, it's a bit classically Oda weird, but at the same time those sorts of aesthetic gambles usually end up paying off quite well for One Piece, and I can't help but find myself excited to see Kyoshiro in action. During this chapter he just had such an intimidating presence around him, especially since he seems to have the authority to just go and send people directly to Queen. All in all I'm just glad we're developing some decent villains outside of the Beast Pirates. And just while we're on that we also had our first look at what a appears to be Orochi this week, although what we saw was a mere silhouette of a multi-headed dragon. So it looks as if Orochi's design may be directly inspired by Yamata no Orochi, a legendary eight-headed and eight-tailed Japanese dragon. However, in the silhouette, we can only currently see five heads, but hey, there could be more. All of his visible dragon heads also look quite goofy, which kind of worries me because I'm very much hoping that Orochi ends up being a legitimately threatening villain rather than a Spandam or a Holden type villain. There was a pretty obvious flag in this chapter with Robin remembering that Kyoshiro called Orochi a coward. So I guess at this moment, it's entirely possible that Orochi is another one of those, how, how shall we put this? Boldly designed smile users. In any case, if Orochi is a fruit user, it's pretty insane either way because well, we already have a dragon in the series in the form of Kaido. So if we do have another mythical dragon Zoan, in theory, that one could trump Kaido's fruit. I mean, if indeed Kaido is the user of a dragon fruit, at this point, he could still be a dragon who ate a more humanoid type of fruit. But whatever the case may be, we could be drawing conclusions too quickly. Oda's storytelling in the early stages of an arc is generally used to mislead the audience for several different effects. So Orochi could be a Paramecia or even a Logia user who enjoys conjuring dragon forms out of whatever he may be. Similar to what Magellan was capable of really. And hey, he could not be a fruit user at all and just likes playing with dragon puppets or something. And yeah, that sounds stupid, but you know what I mean? There are a fair few different ways this could go rather than just down the obvious path. But the entire reason we see or hear from Orochi at all has to do with a new character by the name of Komorosaki, who appears at first glance to be based on a historical figure of the same name who lived during the 17th century. She was a courtesan who worked in a brothel in New Yoshiwara, but rather interestingly, it is her lover who seems to be much more well-known than herself, a samurai by the name of Gonpachi Hirai. And I'm not going to go into the whole story here, but it essentially all ends in tragedy, with Hirai being executed and Komorosaki committing suicide. And I just bring that up because if Oda's going to draw inspiration from such areas of history, then I fully expect to see a form of Gonpachi Hirai appear in the story as well. And you know what? He may very well have already. Apparently Gonpachi became a murderer and a thief in order to continue paying for Komorosaki's time. So perhaps a character like Komazo the Manslayer, who our attention was brought to last chapter, will act as the Gonpachi type character in Wano, driven to murder for the sake of love, or you know, something like that. Anyway, just keep that little piece of history in mind as we move forward with the story, because it might be the key to recruiting another one of Kinemon sought after samurai. We also met young Otoko this chapter, who I'm just going to call Toko, because every time I say Otoko, it just makes me feel like I'm saying man, which is the joke, I suppose. She has an intriguing little quirk where she seems to laugh even when crying, and I feel like we're going to get quite a heartbreaking story behind this. Toko is a Kamuro, so an attendant for a courtesan, in this case Komorosaki, so it may have been very painfully drilled into her at some stage to always remain laughing no matter what the situation. I'm really glad they referenced that quirk though, because when it first popped up in the chapter, I was all like, yeah, Oda man, I don't mean to question your artwork, but that girl absolutely does not look like she's crying. 
And despite that idea mulling around in my head, Toka provided a positively delightful presence during the chapter, which I think can be surprisingly difficult to pull off with child characters, and a lot of the time they just end up being annoying instead. But with Komorosaki and Toko, we have another new faction emerging in Wano, which is great. It's expanding the country nicely, and we can't have a great adventure on the land of Samurai without a hell of a lot of depth in regards to the citizens of Wano. Other than that though, this chapter is pretty much just fun times with the straw hats. Sanji kicking one of the grunts was fun to see, but the best part was when he force fed him the soba noodles afterwards, followed by the second best part of taking the grunts money as payment for the food. Oh, and even Frankie got involved in the action by adopting a move from one of the manliest combatants in the One Piece world, Senor Pink. Frankie 100% learnt the power of the suplex from his duel with the baby clad pink, and I really appreciate those little hints of evolution within characters. But that pretty much does it for chapter 920. Seven. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produces in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line View Patreon, because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. Also, I've recently launched a Teespring store if you're interested in shirts, hoodies, and other miscellaneous items, with proceeds going directly to support the channel as well. And if you'd like to join the fun, then please do head over to my Discord server, where a wide array of shenaniganry takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your thoughts on the chapter. This has been the Grand Line Review, and I'll see you next time.